The NTSB released an accident update a few days ago into the tragic crash of UPS Flight 2976, and once again, Boeing is at the center of a tragedy. 14 people dead, 3 on the aircraft, 11 on the ground, 23 were injured, and although many of us already suspected much of what the NTSB just confirmed, this update adds critical substance to early concerns that the manufacturer may bear responsibility, concerns uncomfortably reminiscent of the 737 MAX. The cliff notes here is that Boeing was aware of an issue in the MD-11 pylon wing connector for more than a decade prior to the fatal accident in November of 2025. They labeled it a non-safety of flight issue. The explosion and the 14 dead tell a different tale. I'm Stan, welcome to Flying for Money. Even before the NTSB released much of anything, many of us had already concluded that a catastrophic failure of the number one engine created a debris field that was ingested by the number two tail-mounted engine, resulting in a loss of thrust on two of the aircraft's three General Electric turbine engines. This all happened at a very high rate of speed, leaving the pilots with no opportunity to safely stop on the runway. Those conclusions were driven by early media images showing a damaged and separated engine combined with visible compressor stall flames from the number two engine. Within days, the NTSB confirmed that the number one pylon had remained attached to the separated engine, and three weeks later, the preliminary report included still images from airport surveillance cameras depicting the separation took place immediately after rotation. Again, that timing aligned with what many of us had already suspected, since gyroscopic forces are highest at rotation and place peak loads on the structures attaching the engine to the aircraft. In the immediate aftermath of the crash, the FAA prohibited operation of MD-11 and DC-10 aircraft within U.S. airspace, effectively grounding the worldwide fleet. A quick background on the fleet. The DC-10 was developed by the Douglas Corporation in the 1960s with its first flight in 1970. It went on to become a backbone of the wide-body fleets for a number of airline operators, but it also developed a troubled safety record. Fatal accidents included explosive decompression caused by cargo door design faults, as well as a strikingly similar number one engine and pylon separation in 1979 following takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. That accident remains the single deadliest aviation disaster in U.S. history, killing 271 people. It was one of three fatal DC-10 crashes in 1979, totaling 600 passenger deaths. Neither of the other two accidents was attributed to an aircraft design failure. One involved landing on a closed runway in Mexico City and colliding with construction equipment in fog, and the other resulted from a navigational input error in Antarctica. McDonnell Douglas Aircraft and the Douglas Corporation merged in 1967, and the updated variant of the DC-10 was designated the MD-11 in 1986. In 1997, Boeing inherited the MD-11 program through its merger with McDonnell Douglas. The NTSB has now released additional data that adds critical detail to the UPS 2976 crash. The preliminary report includes photographs and a technical description of the aft pylon to wing mounting structure, which uses two lugs attached to the pylon of the wing clevis. Both of those lugs were fractured and that failure directly caused the engine separation and the accident. Investigators identified a combination of fatigue cracking and overstress fractures at the lug, as well as a bearing and race bolted to the wing clevis. According to the NTSB's latest accident update, the lug fractures were not independent failures, but were caused by the failure of a bearing race designed to allow the engine a small amount of movement relative to the wing. In simple terms, that movement is intentional and necessary. It reduces structural loads and improves safety by preventing excessive stress from being transferred into the pylon to wing attachment. The aft engine mount uses a bearing and race assembly around the attachment bolt, packed with grease so the two surfaces can move smoothly against each other. If that bearing seizes, the engine can no longer move as designed, effectively locking it rigidly to the wing. 
When that happens, the loads that should have been absorbed by the controlled motion are instead driven directly into the lugs, connecting the pylon to the wing clevis, dramatically increasing the risk of failure. When you look at photos of the fractured bearing race, it almost appears as if it was designed as two separate pieces. The fracture surface is unbelievably smooth. In reality, the race is manufactured as a single unit. And this is where the problem for Boeing begins, because this wasn't a one-off failure. It was a time bomb with a 14-year fuse. On February 7, 2011, Boeing issued a service letter to operators disclosing four prior bearing to race failures across three different aircraft. In each case, the failure initiated at a recessed groove on the interior of the race. Even though the assembly fits tightly within the wing clevis, there was still enough clearance for a fractured race to migrate slightly outwards once it failed. More troubling, Boeing's service letter concluded that this failure did not represent a safety of flight issue. Rather than mandating corrective action, Boeing instructed operators to add a visual inspection of the bearing assembly every 60 months likely aligned with an existing aft pylon inspection. And while Boeing did recommend replacing the bearing with an updated design that eliminated the recessed groove, that replacement was only required if the bearing was deemed unserviceable. Now, if you're keeping score, the 737 MAX program was launched within months of that service letter, meaning it was almost certainly governed by the same safety management framework and likely overseen by many of the same leadership groups and engineers. As we now know, failures in that system combined with insufficient FAA oversight of Boeing's safety of flight determinations played a central role in the two fatal MAX crashes shortly after that aircraft type entered service. Those accidents were tied to the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS, which was introduced to preserve handling characteristics after Boeing installed larger, more efficient engines with a lower center of thrust. The MAX itself was announced after Airbus secured record orders for the A321neo, creating pressure for Boeing to offer a competitive upgrade path for existing 737NG customers. To make that transition economically viable, Boeing needed the MAX to fly like the NG, allowing pilots to move between the two with minimum additional training, training that can easily reach seven figures when multiplied across the crews required to staff each aircraft. MCAS, however, was vulnerable to a single point failure, the loss of just one angle of attack sensor. Any system with safety of flight implications should be built with redundancy, yet Boeing's safety management process concluded that an MCAS failure did not represent a safety of flight issue. Two crashes and 346 deaths prove that judgment catastrophically wrong. And now, with 14 fatalities in the Louisville MD-11 crash, we're seeing a disturbingly familiar pattern. Another known vulnerability, another non-safety of flight determination, and another fatal outcome, suggesting that the same flawed safety culture may have persisted from at least 2011 through the MAX developmental era. Well, links the MD-11 and the 737 MAX isn't the hardware, it's the decision making. In both cases, Boeing identified a known failure mode, evaluated it internally, labeled it a non-safety of flight issue, and allowed the aircraft to continue operating until a catastrophic accident proved that assessment wrong. In the case of the 737 MAX, this happened relatively early in the airframe's life cycle. With the MD-11, it was a slow burn. It's worth noting here that following the massive fallout of the 737 MAX debacle, Boeing has overhauled its safety management apparatus and the FAA has placed the manufacturer under a perpetual microscope. And the issue here with the MD-11 is that by the time all of this occurred, the bearing to race safety bulletin was over a decade old. Most likely there was no review or analysis of it. It just sat there ticking away. The NTSB also released data confirming that two of the aircraft's three engines failed during takeoff, and that data also reinforces an important point. The flight crew did everything right. Following the catastrophic failure of the number one engine, they maintained a safe airspeed during the initial climb exactly as procedures require. That airspeed only degraded in the final seconds of the flight when the aircraft began descending towards a catastrophic ground impact. 
The failure of engine number one is reflected in the data by the complete loss of engine one indications when it separated from the aircraft with the engine fire warning activating simultaneously. That alert was triggered by the loss of the engine fire detection system itself, which the aircraft's automation interprets as a catastrophic engine failure, an event that, in most cases, includes an engine fire as it did here. The tail mounted engine number two began indicating fluctuations in N1 fan rotation within a few seconds of the separation of engine number one, consistent with the ingestion of foreign object shrapnel from the pirouetting of the separated number one engine around the fuselage. 17 seconds after the whole affair began, the tail mounted engine flamed out and the fates of the pilots and innocent bystanders was violently sealed. 17 seconds. That's all it took from rotation to inevitability. Not because the crew failed, not because the airplane was mishandled, but because a known vulnerability was allowed to persist until physics sent its leg breaker to collect the debt. The pilots flew the airplane exactly as trained, maintaining airspeed and control in a situation that offered them no remaining margin. There was no skill left to apply, no checklist left to save them, and no runway left to stop in. This accident wasn't the result of bad luck or an unforeseeable chain of events. It was the end state of a decision made years earlier, one that concluded a known failure mode did not rise to the level of a safety of flight concern. History has shown us repeatedly that those conclusions carry consequences, sometimes quickly as they did with the 737 MAX, and sometimes slowly as they did here after 14 quiet years of continued operation. Aviation safety is built on a simple principle. Identify and fix problems before people die. The uncomfortable reality is that the edge of knowledge is often fuzzy, and some failures only reveal themselves in the aftermath of a fatal accident. Every flight exists on a knife's edge between risk and efficiency. Manufacturers are under constant pressure to make airplanes cheaper to build, easier to operate, and more efficient to fly a market force no less real than gravity itself. An ongoing tension between economic pressure and the continued survival of pilots, passengers, and innocent people beneath the flight path. When manufacturers, regulators, or anyone else in that system gets the calculus wrong, the clock starts ticking. In Louisville, that clock terminated in a fire alarm and 14 lives that had nothing to do with corporate decisions made far from the flight deck. As always, God bless them and stay safe.